Dette er den ukentlige nyhetssendingen fra Europa. Every day they used to be business sitting there for magic potions is trying me friends stealing his wall We're live Sean We're live Sean Um so uh, Who's right. going? Who's going to introduce the the show? Oh, well, I suppose I might as well. No, uh, welcome um, to European News Weekly. Another jam-packed, uh, full of interviews, interesting information. Uh, maybe not quite so many interviews this uh, week, but uh, we do have some really quality interviews that are certainly worth listening to. I hope you get time. Um, I think what we'll be doing, we'll be covering in the first part of the show, European news. Uh, we'll probably have that a bit less than an hour. Uh, in the second part of the show, uh, it goes on just slightly more than an hour. We have um, Kevin Hester with the Extinction Report, and we have a, a bit of a discussion. Um, it went on a bit longer than normal, but there was uh, some very interesting points being brought up. Uh, then we have a special report from uh, uh, our uh, blogger friend, um, John Doe, as we will call him, um, Doe, in Tokyo. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then in the third uh, show, we're still sorting it out, but uh, we're hoping to have a surprise uh, guest who uh, recently got out of court. Um, we can't say his name, otherwise he wouldn't be a surprise. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, and we've got other things, but we're, we're seeing if we can get the communication there. And there's certainly, uh, we'll be breaking down some issues with the criminal justice bill that came out in Ireland as well in that third hour. Um, I think that's, have I missed anything, Jimmy? <laughs> I, I'm still getting over uh, our own John Doe. I, I couldn't, you, you know, six. This is our sixth month anniversary show, and we are now European News Weekly is now six months on the go, and uh, and it's just ironic that on the uh, six month anniversary we get our very first John Doe. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're, we're truly becoming a multinational uh, sort of uh, radio activist show, and I hope that people appreciate the, all the input we get from uh, many people, many sources through Facebook um, and uh, YouTube and on the blogs. Um, and you know, we have plenty more activists and surprising guests coming up in the future. Uh, so bear with us. So we got a little comment already from Tony in the chat box. Sean's got a crackle. So yeah. <laughs> are you sitting? Oh. On, are you sitting on a firework, Sean? By any chance? I'm not sitting on a firework at all. <laughs> uh, do apologise about the crackle. If I sit back a bit, maybe I won't be interfering with the microphone. Ah, right, 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 right. Okay, okay. I um, seem to have an incredibly sensitive microphone. I can't even scratch or anything because I'm worried about it. Yeah, well, I, uh, yeah, well, uh, you wouldn't think that when you're kicking it around the place you know <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that and uh okay right so uh, well should we get stuck into some news because uh, we're going to be a bit pushed for time this week i think well you know at least this week you know we have a little bit of an opportunity to cover some news so if you want to push off uh we're on the european news section this week now so um yeah you kick off and uh, i'll see if i can catch up in the meantime Okay, well, what we're going to do is I'm just going to go straight to, uh, uh, there's a new report out basically from Al Jazeera, and it's concerning uh, uranium in Iraq, um, and I would say that uh, that's kind of worth a, a visit. Um, um, we've got more coming on that in the near future, and Chris Busby's bringing out a, a, a report, I believe, on the uranium uh, binding to DNA. There's also been a study in Europe called the Melody, uh, which is the first study of its kind in theory, uh, the first uh, open study, at least, to uh, be looking into the effects of uranium and how it binds with DNA and causes problems. Um, so this is uh, very late in the day, but at least it is being done and we are being hopeful. Uh, it might be worth pointing out that in 2011, Chris Busby, I think it was 2011, uh, Chris Busby was chased around the uh, conference for Melody um, by the chairperson, who was the head of what, the nuclear industry in Sweden, uh, trying to get the mi microphone off him uh, because he was uh, giving people some real information. <laughs> uh, he didn't succeed, obviously. Uh, well done, Chris Busby, that's all I can say. 
Um, but that, that, that is a report that's coming out, and you can read Al Jazeera. That's probably the reason why Al Jazeera is bringing the topic up. Um, I'm uh, also just because uh, we, we will be talking about uh, issues about uh, food, radioactive food, a little bit in uh, Japan, uh, and it might be worth mentioning that uh, Fukushima baby milk formula has been seized in central China. Uh, now, of course, that same Fukushima is 400 uh, uh, kilograms of baby milk uh, was basically produced near the site of Japan's Fukushima na na uh, nuclear plant. Why is that relevant to Europe? Well, Europe has an open policy of taking Fukushima food in uh, they, they say well basically it's uh, if they can get it into a, a nearby country like say the UK it can then be transported throughout the European Union uh, and of course the UK you're allowed uh, uh, quite a high amount of uh, becquerels per kilogram much higher than in Japan uh, but anyway that's uh, just a little story hmm, I thought I'd yeah bring we're, up we're actually we're actually blessed here in Europe Sean because we can actually take in more <laughs> more uranium and more uh, cesium than any other country in the world so you know we're kind of lucky yeah. aren't we well, it's obviously uh, sort of a, a product of the Aryan race that we can deal with larger quantities of radiation than everywhere else. Uh, but the, the reality is, of course, that's not the case. Uh, what, what, what it is, basically, is uh, UNSCEAR, U-N-S-C-E-A-R, uh, the radiological uh, sort of uh, group, turned around and said that they would uh, have uh, less of a, an amount in Japan because more of the food actually has contamination in it. So they, they had to reduce it from 1,500 becquerels to 100 becquerels uh, to be on the safe side. And that's because of members of uh, UNSCEAR like Kreerad and that were, were demanding that something be done about it uh, to reduce the intake of uh, radionuclides. So there was some sense in that uh, group. Mm. But there were others in that group that just wanted to get rid of it and just allow any amount of becquerels. And uh, that's kind of what's going on in the UK. They allow the becquerels by not testing. Um, and we did some research on that um, uh, last year before I got kicked out of the UK. <laughs> and uh, basically there was, uh, there was definitely issues about non-testing as a way of getting around <coughs> anything to do with dose or, or quantity. So uh, anyway, uh, I just thought I'd, uh, I'm going to drop in an Irish show. I would normally leave it in the last uh, hour, but just in case people are going for European news, uh, Lorraine Higgins is trying to bring a bill in. Uh, that's uh, going to stop abuse online and of course um, uh, the journal .ie, uh, uh, Tom Murphy uh, basically writes that you know it's totally unacceptable um, and that she her solution is ill-conceived and there are better ways of dealing with this um, and there's a st story there on the journal if you want to get over to it uh, but relevant because we have other uh, stories coming up uh, to do with hacking and stacking and what have you of activists and uh, various journalists so um, I would also say that uh, Stop the War Coalition uh, is very concerned uh, about the UK school children expressing support for Palestine accused of terrorist like views uh, now that won't be the only story that we've uh, we've, we've been covering um, but uh, on this particular topic but we're seeing a, a more rampant control of, of children in school and what they think and uh, it's uh, very very worrying if if you were Irish in London uh, and they brought this law in in the 70s uh, it would have been meant that every Irish person would have been uh, called a radical and would have been on a database for uh, domestic extremism uh, if they weren't anyway um, <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up there Sean yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> well, I, know, I know one that is anyway uh, anyway I'm not going to go on about that okay. uh, less than a third of Finnish people, and I know you've got a story to follow this up, but less than a third of Finnish people uh, think that uh, nuclear power is a good idea um, in, a new, in a sort of a, 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 a basically a new nuclear de development that's going on. And I'm going to let uh, Jimmy um, uh, try and uh, work out what that's called. <laughs> Sorry, Jimmy. Well, it's uh, it's it's kind of strange though. If you've got if you've got less than a third of a population who do not agree with a policy which is being implemented by a, a government where is the democracy gone at, at the end of the day at less than a third that, that that's unreal that they can still go ahead with these proposals even though like two more than two thirds are against it's just ah i'll tell you what Urgh!
It drives me we're, nuts. We're, see, we're, seeing, we're seeing that all over the world. In Japan, 70% of people are against nuclear power, you know, and they're still trying to bring in nuclear power, even though it's mad earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, uh, volcanic ash dropping out of the sky, uh, you know, the, the threat of uh, pyroplastic flows rushing across a nuclear plant, uh, <laughs> you know, all these kind of things that, 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 that uh, are being ignored, you know, just to get the nuclear reactors back online yeah. so they can make some more depleted uranium, you know. Oh, God, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and even though you were, we were having a little chat about this, this, this uranium uh, issue earlier on, like, you know, yeah. what you were saying was they were operating at a loss now. Yeah, yeah, thirty-eight dollars a kilogram. They need over forty dollars to break even, um, and you know, on the upside, it does mean that Greenland would be very unlikely to develop the uranium mines uh, because of the cost. But I suspect that will get subsidised by the Americans because the Americans are very short on uranium. So, uh, but that's a, a story that's developing. Um, well, yeah, indeed, so I mean, uh, <laughs> Human Rights Watch actually on Al Jazeera, they're, they're the ones. Uh, well, uh, UK Prevent Program, it's called. It's infiltrating schools and targeting students who express certain views. Uh, so I just thought I'd bring us back to that one. Um, and that's Al Jazeera, and it's on their human rights section. Um, now, on human rights again, France approves Big Brother surveillance powers despite UN concern. So the UN is saying, hang on a minute, you know, what about freedom of speech and, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, privacy and all these other things? Uh, France has gone, no, we don't need that. If England doesn't need it and America doesn't need it, uh, then we don't need it. Um, and Australia doesn't need it and all the other five eyes. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a good story there in The Guardian. France approves Big Brother surveillance powers despite UN concern. And we've been reporting on this over the weeks, haven't we, Jimmy? So, uh, oh, I'll tell you what, you know, what don't we cover? I, I find it hard myself keeping up these days with some of the topics that we cover so it's it's sure. taken a it's taken a monumental effort uh, on my little old brain just to keep up with it but uh, i'll do my best you know i'll do my best yeah it is, it's, it's, it's massive uh, meanwhile in italy uh, beppo grillo is calling for nationalization of the italian banks and exit from the euro um, and this sounds quite good it sounds very scissory like but uh, the thing is that uh, the uh the, 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 this particular party are very much connected although they're talking about explicit Nazism. Um, uh, so they basically actually are, you know, there's quite a lot of right-wing and sort of really, uh, you know, sort of uh, racist people involved with this party. But the, I don't think The Guardian picked up on that. Um, so, but anyway, it's, uh, it's uh, quite interesting. He's only calling for an exit to the Euro at the moment, uh, but he may well be, you know, that particular party would be very happy to come out of the European Union altogether and probably not be applying uh, Euro uh, human rights, uh, you know, been having access to the European Human Rights Corps, which of course the UK fears greatly. Um, so, uh, right, that's another little story. Uh, I'll just uh, trip on ahead. Former head of Collapsed Portuguese, Portuguese Bank is under house arrest. Uh, it's not too bad. It's a good start. Uh, it sounds like he could be going to prison. Um, and this is following up uh, Iceland, who decided that uh, crime uh, should be punished. Um, and the Portuguese have obviously taken that point on as well. And so, uh, yeah, heads of Portuguese bank or head of uh, uh, collapsed Portuguese bank is under house arrest. And it looks like he's going to be getting into trouble. You can get that one on Euronews.com. So we've got another little story here. This is also UK connected. Uh, Trafigura, a toxic disaster in, uh, in uh, Cote de Leon, it shows the UK needs to get tough on corporate crime. Uh, this uh, is amnesty.org. Uh, um, so basically what's, what was happening is that there was a toxic disaster um, and uh, that was in 2006. So uh, the waste was dumped in 18 locations in and around the city, uh, city of Adijan and the Côte d'Ivory, uh, sorry, Ivory Coast. Uh, more than 100,000 people sought medical assistance and the dumpsters required extensive clean, uh, dump site, sorry, required extensive clean-up and decontamination. Uh, and the residents worry quite rightly 
slightly that the pollution still lingers today. Um, and uh, it was uh, connected to uh, UK uh, sort of finance. So uh, basically there's a whole situation going on there. Um, and I would say go over to Amnesty International and look up that story. It's quite shocking. Uh, and it just shows how corporations are affecting uh, people in, in Africa as well as uh, other countries, you know, in Japan as well and, various, and, and in Ireland. Um, so how these corporations work. Um, how they make money and how they ignore disasters um, and we'll be talking about the Fukushima disaster in our two. So uh, another little story um, which may not seem to affect us but China's uh, global research has put out a story and it's been uh, put out in other, uh, sort of some other outlets but China's record dumping of US treasuries leaves Goldman Sachs speechless. Um, now uh, there's a lot of things we could talk about this but uh, I would say go over to Global Research, read the article, it's quite well uh, put together, they've got some good data there backing it up uh, but it's uh, very scary, well, we knew that we reported on China um, freezing uh, the banks the other day, the Chinese government, communist Chinese government stepping in and putting complete control in uh, their free market quote unquote and uh, we're now sort of seeing uh, uh, manipulation of that market and we did talk about China targeting uh, uh, Taiwan uh, with the, uh, the new uh, development bank that they're going into with Russia but they are they said they wouldn't uh, target people but they have and so when we're looking at China now it looks like they're actually dumping treasuries uh, because uh, they're basically going to be screwing up the uh, economy of the U.S. Uh, mainly because the U.S. is, you know, is being so militarized that uh, that they have to probably come back in some way or other. Uh, this would be an excellent way. Um, they're just pumping up the American economy, and now they're dumping it. Um, so basically, uh, that's quite worrying for us here in Europe, obviously, as you can imagine, because if there's a crash in the US dollar uh, and a bigger reliance on Russia and China, uh, where will we be? Uh, th things to think about. And um, still in the UK, uh, but properly in the UK, we've got Caroline and Baroness Jones take uh, the government to court to protect people's privacy. Um, and this is against uh, you know, what's going on in France. Uh, we've had that for some time now. And uh, the MPs and uh, Caroline Lucas, the MP, and Baroness Jones uh, basically uh, have been doing FRI F sorry, freedom of information requests. And we're now seeing that they're basically uh, having to take them to court to really get, uh, get to grips with what's going on with GCH and the Five Eyes spying system, which is spying on people like you and I and uh, on everyone uh, who basically has someone who has a, a point of view in their family. Um, so uh, just something to watch out for there, but some good news that, that Caroline Lucas and Baroness Jones in the UK there, and uh, Caroline Lucas uh, is a Green MP obviously, uh, are taking the government to court. Uh, and Caroline Lucas was involved in the case uh, where she was supporting a lady who a uh, policeman, undercover policeman, got her pregnant and left her just sitting there with the child. Uh, exactly what the Tory government said that women shouldn't be doing, uh, but uh, they're supporting the policeman that that, uh, turned around and did that and uh, supporting the police uh, uh, sort of management that allowed that to happen so um, right that, that was a few little stories to get cracking with Jimmy uh, we've got we've got the story about the hacking um, so I think do, do you want to uh, fill us in with any stories that you've got you've got one of the Finland stories I believe well I've got one to Finland but I just want to take a little moment just to say uh, Liam Heffernan will be joining us at 6 p.m. there about Sean so um, so we've got uh, Liam on the Skype now so I'm delighted so we're going to get another update on the Shell to see a protest and that court case that happened in Castlebar so I'm really looking forward to that so um, well, before you start, Jimmy, I just yeah. thought I'd like to point out to, okay. to our viewers and uh, certainly to uh, to anybody that may have taken us up on the stories that we've been covering, uh, that we had two stories breaking uh, after our story. Uh, one was on CBC, which involved uh, the uh, Canadian fires and the effects on the people. Um, and basically, CBC, the very next day after our podcast was sent around to various media, uh, they came out with a story which was exactly the same, according to Candice Paul uh, from the Dene uh, Nations tribe. So she was quite impressed. 
that we may, we don't know for sure, but we may have uh, encouraged the Canadian uh, Broadcasting Corporation to do this human uh, interest story because they hadn't been doing it up to that point. And on the second point in Ireland, uh, um, the journal IE very surprisingly started getting into the um, alcohol story. <laughs> and so uh, police drinking, uh, being paid alcohol by Shell Oil, uh, about uh, 24,000 pounds worth uh, uh, for their uh, efforts to uh, uh, sort of harass uh, protesters and locals and farmers and just general, and Liam, uh, you know, obviously who's coming on as well. Um, and they were paid loads of booze. And the Times came out with a story um, which said, no, this is not true. And then uh, the journal the very next day came out with a story saying it is true. And they even had uh, a testimony which they could have got off our podcast. And I hope they did use it um, and it certainly uh, it certainly was uh, uh, interesting timing um, yeah. so but of course we're, see, we're, we're seeing some interesting development like uh, it's one thing I didn't notice now before we started doing this show but um, we had Jerry on last week now Jerry made the call to uh, I don't I'm not sure Midwest radio he made the call to Midwest radio and says will they cover his story and they, and they made the point of saying well if it's in the papers, we'll cover it. If it's not, we won't. And uh, so the story never got covered. So, in a sense, we got the covered story. So, in 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 in, in, a, in a nice way, we got the scoop on it. Like so, maybe that gave them the platform to actually cover the story and, and start getting it out. But we're noticing this week the story is getting out. Like, and uh, I think yeah. everybody in the country should be watching this story. Um, what are our guarded? getting paid on drink for but we'll cover this in the Irish section you know at the end of the day like, sure. but it, it is an interesting development um, but it, it shows the power of, uh, of social media uh, and the fact that information you know the GCHQs of the world and the social media uh, sort of companies are designed to stop and block uh, the information flow between activists and uh, journalists and the, all the like. So uh, it's very important that people come onto our show, do the interviews, get the testimony out there, and give uh, give people the opportunity to speak. And just as a side issue, you know, also charities. If charities have to uh, um, charities have to get their information, peer-reviewed journals, and we've talked about how corrupted peer reviews can be, you know. Um, and also, they have the only other source is, is the media, what they call the mainstream media. So, if they don't, if you don't, if you're not in either of those formats, then your cause will not get heard. So, it's very important that we encourage the media to get these stories out, so that activists can act on them. They can take it a step further in terms of the UN, in terms of pressure groups. Uh, and it's really part of our democracy that we have this mechanism. And this mechanism is very much under threat and has been for some years. So uh, it's very important to make that point. All right. So getting back to the Europe, because I, I do believe we have a little bit of um, hacking news to cover. So I'll, I'll just get through the few little bits and pieces of European news that I did sure. tweak on to there during the week now. And I noticed over in uh, England, uh, angry British farmers stage rolling tractor protesters. And uh, British farmers are furious about uh, falling milk and lamb prices and have used tractors to stage a rolling rally on roads across Staffordshire and Derbyshire. Uh, dozens of fed up farmers from across both counties took part in peaceful demonstrations I will mention peaceful and uh, which focused on the A50 road in Blythe Bridge uh, in Staffordshire uh, also up in Scotland hundreds of police officers convicted of offences including sex crimes theft assault and possessing indecent images so uh, this was uh, 24th of July in 2015 uh, forces across the UK revealed 309 police officers and police community support officers which uh, PCSOs were convicted of offences from nine, from 2012 to, uh, to June of this year Hundreds of police officers have been convicted of offences in the last three years, including sex crimes, assaults, possessing indecent images of children, new figures have shown. But the number of convicted officers is thought to be much higher, as only 25 out of 45 force provided figures, uh, uh, only 25 out of 45 forces provide figures following uh, the investigation by the Press Association. 
uh, currently at least 295 police officers and PCSOs uh, with convictions are serving with the police according to separate figures from 18 forces. Morse forces refused to reveal how many of their officers had previous convictions because of the cost of retrieving the information. Police also refused to disclo disclose the names of the officers involved in the crimes, arguing that identifying them would breach data protection laws. Uh, the UK's biggest force, which is the Metropolitan Police, said 178 police officers had been convicted of offences from 2012 to March 31st of 2015. Uh, 54 of the officers were still serving, by the way, uh, with the force including uh, 10 who were awaiting the conclusion of misconduct <coughs> review hearings. Uh, now, over the last two years, the Home Office has introduced a programme of measures to improve standards of behaviour in the police, including making the, making the dis disciplinary uh, system more uh, independent and transparent, tr transparent through introducing uh, hearings in public, preventing officers resigning or retiring to avoid dismissal, uh, and from next year, introducing legally qualified independent chairs on misconduct hearing panels. The government will finish the job of police reform uh, and introduce new legislation this year, apparently. So it will overhaul the police complaints and disciplinary system strengthen protections for police whistleblowers in charge and change the role, powers uh, and governments of the IPCC and the, the remit of the HMIC. Well, that's, uh, that's pretty damning, like, you know, to, to think that, like, we have criminals because <laughs> that's all you can call you we've got criminals like mind you know i don't know you couldn't make this stuff up sean you know the the criminals are in are, are in charge of keeping the keeping the peace and and uh, i'll tell you what scary stuff well obviously we've, got, we've been covering quite a lot of this sort of situation in ireland and uh, there are a lot of good people in the police force and there are you know there's certainly been some good you know whistleblowers that have come out and talked about the problems um, mm, so, mm. but but yeah, it's uh, it's not good when they're not being transparent, and ah, that seems God, to be yeah. half of the course now. No, I tell you what, we're going to have some serious bombshell stuff coming up in the Irish Hour. Um, yeah, I'll tell you what, like what's going on here in Ireland is just downright, it's just ludicrous. But anyway, that's for the last hour. But I also see protesters chase Scotland's only Tory MP out of town after he turned up to open a food bank uh, on the 24th of July. Uh, coming out of the Daily Record at UK and Secretary of State uh, for Scotland, David Mundell was in Dumfries to launch the, the Trustel Trust Food Bank this morning when he was greeted by a 150 strong crowd. Now, I had to say, like, pro this is the this is the usual spin that you get from the papers. Like, you know, you, this is this is what you're going. To, we hear it here in Ireland too. Protesters shouted "Shame on you!" and screamed at Scottish. Uh, a Scottish Secretary, David Mundell, after he sneaked out the back door of the Trust Trust operated facility in the Dumfries and Galloway town. They surrounded uh, the white Ford Focus motor he was in, which he had to slowly edge his way through the raging mob. They say raging mob, right? <laughs> With the... With the help of police escort, uh, people banged on the windows and at first refused to let the vehicle move until four, they have to, four uniformed police officers sort of like came in like brandishing their swords and stuff to help the poor man get out of town safely. So that was interesting. <laughs> it couldn't have been that violent if four policemen could four. come in and just deal with the situation. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, <laughs> you know, but you've got to love the way these papers put the spin on it, you know. <laughs> yeah. they, they, I'm surprised they didn't up the numbers to 40. For this, <laughs> yeah, God knows where they were. They were probably busy sort of collecting sort of consignments of alcohol from from Shell somewhere over there on oh, God knows. <laughs> yeah. right. uh, okay, well, I think I think we could go into the into the hacking story we've got for this week, right? Right. Do you want me to open it up? Yeah, please do. Please do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, look, I'll tell you what happened to me this week. I blog a lot on Facebook, and I'm on Naomi Wolf's uh, uh, Daily Clout, you know. And we, we, we basically I, all I do is I comment, and sometimes she picks up our stories. Um, and thank you, Naomi, for picking up Candice uh, Paul's story about the uh, uh, First Nations people of Canada uh, and the fire wildfire impact. So thank you for that. 
So, but, but at the end of the day, we're, we're sort of looking at uh, uh, what's been happening. Now, Naomi Wolf was trying to put up a story about the UK uh, and a certain organisation in the UK basically accepting the Palestinian right to return. Okay, that's Palestinians who've been ejected out of uh, Palestine over the years, decades, um, and their right to return home. Uh, now, of course, um, the Israeli government has been dead against this, so uh, we're not sure who was doing hacking, but uh, I'll just run through all the different uh, subjects that, that were being hacked. So num number one was Naomi Wolf. She wasn't able to post that particular article and actually had to ask somebody else to post it. Um, and eventually we were posting the, the text and all this type of stuff, and eventually I think somebody did manage to get uh, uh, the actual post, the article posted. But Naomi couldn't do it on her, her thing, so there was a block on Naomi Wolf's uh, Facebook for, that, for certain links, obviously. Uh, now, Mark Taliano, who does a lot of commenting uh, and a very prolific uh, blogger, uh, basically was also having problems with Facebook on the same day that Naomi Wolf was. Um, and basically Brendan Norrell on the same day was having problems um, and also uh, Google had censored uh, an article she had done about uh, First Nations uh, uh, sort of uh, person who was basically uh, shot and killed, some ac uh, an anonymous activist I believe she referred him to, uh, was killed by a policeman and the story was being uh, stamped down on by the Canadian government uh, and nobody was, uh, you know, Google was obviously involved with that. Um, and then we also had a, uh, so Brenda Norrell obviously is a great journalist and uh, hopefully someday in the future we'll have her in to, for an interview, uh, a very interesting story there. Um, and so then we've got Libby Halevi who does a nuclear hot seat and uh, she's very, uh, a very good uh, friend and you know, a, a colleague you know, in terms of activism. Uh, she does uh, very much a similar, to, well we're doing quite a similar format to her with interviews. Um, and uh, she's been doing it, it's very slanted on the nuclear issue mostly. Um, so basically she's been doing that and she's certainly uh, giving us a big heads up and likes what we're doing. It's very, uh, the, the two uh, podcasts go well together in terms of information sharing. Um, and interviews with testimonies, you know, um, these these are very important things. So, uh, but she, what happened with her is that she was a, she was blocked from getting her her podcast up. She's been hacked and all sorts of things in the past, but she upgraded her server, and now she had problem getting into a control panel. So she now has to upgrade her security even more. Um, but uh, anyway, I just thought, and so that was, we've had uh, Palestinian issues, uh, First Nations issues in Canada. Uh, we've had uh, Libby Halevi, Halevi, who was doing South American mining, was the issue there with gold, you know, uh, mining of gold and the uranium pollution from that. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, Mark Taliano, just a very prolific uh, uh, sort of blogger like myself. Now, I was also having a lot of problems, and I was also blocked from sharing Japan Today articles about um, 3,100 Fukushima residents that were basically um, uh, seeking compensation in the courts. Uh, I was unable to share this, and I got the strange uh, sort of thing, on, you know, sort of notification from Facebook that they were trying to fix it, there was a glitch, and I was able to post other stuff before and after, and then I'd come back to it and try posting it, and I'd always get the same message that there was some glitch and uh, I couldn't share it. Um, so I was able to share the text to get around it, but uh, I did get a screenshot also off the message, uh, which was quite unusual. Um, and uh, yeah, so there was a bit of a trend going on. Um, so I, I would say at the end of the day that uh, we were looking at a sort of, it seemed like uh, a sort of a, an action was going on. There was a, a sort of a, an organized uh, attack on bloggers and the stopping of sharing of, uh, of uh, links and information in various ways. Um, so, and it's very blatant, it's really in your face. Um, so everybody was aware of it and I did talk to them in, uh, all at different times. Um, and uh, concerning Libby's one, I think Jimmy, you had uh, some interesting issues this week. Uh, oh, your, first, that's your, your, your first proper <laughs> hack hack. That's my first hack, uh, you know, really, since, if, you know, I used to mess around with uh, different types of viri and uh, years and years ago, like, you know, and then, you know, when you're on a Windows system, you kind of expect a hack, like, but I got my first real hack this week, I'm sure of it, I'm sure of yeah. it. I, I, was, I, I was blocked from accessing Ning.com servers for a start, right? So that meant I couldn't 
get into the PIR chat box. Now, we were getting ready to do a load of interviews the other night as well too. Um, you know, because we usually do a lot of our interviews on the Saturday evening. We, we get a lot of our work done on Saturday evening. So it was, it was strange that it happened on Saturday evening, for example. And I just couldn't get over it. I was on the Thor network. I was in the PIR chat. And next thing, my Thor enabled browser just started scrolling by itself. It was scrolling. It was just indiscriminately scrolling. I couldn't focus on chat. I couldn't focus on anything. It was scrolling. It says, right, okay. So I switched over to Firefox. It was indiscriminately scrolling. Everything was indiscriminately scrolling. <laughs> it was just unbelievable. And uh, so um, I put that down. Uh, yeah, I was definitely got the feeling that somebody's saying, howdy doody there, Jimmy. Uh, look what we can do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's exactly. That's how. Exa I mean, I had a similar thing. I was uh, I was trying to put a post up. Uh, funnily enough, about Chris Busby, you know, in Ura a depleted uranium. Um, and what they did, they just shut off my internet in my home in England, London. And uh, and I thought, right, I'm not having that. I jumped on my bike and went straight down to my local library, walked in, plugged it up, um, and I just punched. It. I had it all on a word, a, de um, a file, you know, a, a document file, and then just uploaded it quickly to the blog. Uh, job done. And uh, I would say within five minutes, the whole screen just jumps. <laughs> there seems to be some effect about hacking and, and how the screen behaves. So it, would that be? Would, would you describe that as a scrolling effect? Well, I, I had the scrolling thing before as well. Right. Actually. Right. Uh, okay. But, but that was a separate thing. But this was. Uh, I was just thought I'd mention this because just to let people know that you seem to. If you go onto a, a, a random computer and you want to put up a post and you're having problems putting that post up, um, you will have about five minutes to get that post up. If you get in and out within five minutes, they probably can't trace you. And I did uh, hear this um, talked about on on a hacking forum as well. And they reckoned it was about six minutes. But I think it was five minutes when my screen jumped. Um, and the next time I went to that library and tried that again, uh, they changed their policy and everybody had to sign in and had to give a name and address and ID. <laughs> <laughs> it's a library. It's a, so, like, I think this week we find that the, uh, the Garda Commissioner, right, rejects claims journalist phones being tapped, right? So this was yeah, on uh, Thursday. Okay. Yeah. And uh, she, the possibility that on Garda Shikona are tapping journalists' phones has been strongly rejected by the Garda Commissioner Noreen O'Sullivan. Speaking today, a passing out ceremony at Temple Moor in County Tipperary for 97 new Garda recruits, she responds to the question on an on an Garda phone hacking by saying, absolutely not. We're very much, we very much respect the role of journalism and the role of the media in making sure that the public interest is best served. We are very determined and committed to continue in that vein. What do you make of that? I, I think there was a lot of journalists laughing their heads off. I mean, I, I've been dealing with journalists from all over the world, and there's not one that I've found that doesn't uh, imagine that they're being hacked, and they come up with lots of uh, interesting ways to get interviews. You know, if they're doing Skype, for instance, mm. uh, but one of the ways is to get the person, if they're being targeted in some way and a bit worried, uh, to go to a, a random Skype call, do the interview, and then come out. But it doesn't mean that it's not recorded. It just means that the it's uh, it, it's uh, not pinning down an IP address that they can get to that person on. Um, and uh, and it you know it also, obviously it's another level of difficulty for the uh, security services uh, to try and track what's going on if people do that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, and journalists have a range of uh, of uh, security uh, minded things just because uh, of uh, the GCHQ and NSA spying machines, you know. Okay. Well, if I, if I was to rewind just a little bit, okay, and if I was to go back to the 11th of May in 2012 in an article by Henry MacDonald which was put, released through theguardian.com okay now journalists in Ireland have raised concerns about the, the country's draconian gagging orders on police officers taking to the media including allegations that the state is monitoring their mobile phone calls to try to reveal sources now, Dublin-based reporters, uh, some of whom are under debt threats from armed criminal gangs, have told Media Guardian that the Irish police force Garda Síochána has questioned them about police, police contacts, threatened them with arrest and has been checking their mobile phone calls to suspected sources. Right, 
that says it all, doesn't it? And, yeah. And, and, it, and they also had the protesters. Uh, it was admitted that the protesters were spied on by uh, I uh, was it that uh, Irish security company that works for Shell. Um, so In, indeed. And you've got G4S floating around the back background there. With uh, so there's, there's lots of uh, there's lots of opportunities for hacking, but they could the government can deny it. Um, uh, because they even said that the Irish Defence Force did no, they're the ones that do the phone hacking in Ireland. They said there's no way that, uh, that they've had one uh, request for phone hacking. And that was the same year that they were after uh, sort of Irish uh, terrorists. So that's a load of rubbish. They well, must well, have had well this is it, but we've been drawn the conclusion also that there's not just, like, while they may not have been receiving calls for um, are, are, are receiving reports of of like requests for putting taps on people. We've heard from Claire Daly clearly that you know you expect this sort of thing, you know, and that's that's an independent minister in the Irish government, and she's telling us directly you may expect it. We 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 know what's going on, and it's to be expected. So yeah, you know, considering we know from that report, like one reporter said that she was questioned thirty times in in just over a decade and was under sustained pressure to reveal sources. And also, Ian Melton, the deputy editor of Dublin's Evening Herald newspaper, said that the Guardian appeared more interested in who the source of the stories was than in acting against the crime boss who put a €20,000 bounty on the head of his colleague, Mick McCafferty. This, it's just astounding. It sounded like it, it just seems like the Gardaí are just hell-bent on protecting criminals. Is, is that what we're up against? Well, it's the same in the UK. I don't. I don't think it's the Guardi. It's just. It, but it is the management. You know, you have to go to management level. The people that are making decisions to support uh, corporations instead of uh, human rights and and people's rights. You know. Um, you know. So we've got this fracking thing in the UK. Uh, once again, uh, the police will have to support all the frackers. You know, and uh, you know the protesters you know have to be you know have to be dealt with in the way that they're being a trained to do and b being told to do well so, interesting you know, interesting that you bring up human rights there because the human rights organization index on censorship said that the irish republic uh, republic's 2005 garda Síochána act especially especially clause 62 of the legislation outlawing uh, most rank and file police contact with the media was not the behaviour of a European democracy. Now, under the Act, Irish police officers who speak to journalists without authorisation from their superiors can face fines of up to €75,000, dismissal from the force, or even seven years in prison. Now, Index on Censorship described the Act as the, the recent upsurge in Gardaí pursuing journalists over their sources as akin to a kind of behaviour one would expect in an unreconstructed dictatorship yeah yeah no it's uh, i mean it's we're, we're, we're having with technology you know people are only starting to wake up to it but i mean uh i think it was uh, there was a, a hack of cheaters for cheaters dating site um <clears throat> where they got all the names of all the people who were doing the cheating and then published them on online um so th this shows the the fallacy in NSA and GCHQ making sure that software is built to be spied on so that they feel better uh, because other people are using the same backdoors and you know it's it's it will it will destroy the internet uh, we need we need secure and safe and encrypted browsing and we need protections in place to to keep the uh, security companies in sp in place and then when, you know, people try to do hacking, maybe those same security companies could be tracking the hackers as opposed to checking out the journalists, the bloggers and the activists, you know, mm. uh, which is uh, a lot of the population. Yeah. Well, from, from the same article that I'm reading here, I'm, I'm sorry to keep harping on about this one article, but I just thought it was very, very revealing. Like, um, no. So an index spokesman, uh, we're, we're talking here about the uh, the index on censorship which is the human rights organization index on censorship uh, just to remind folk uh, the spokesman Porik Reedy said reporters should not be forced to operate in fear of police surveillance Reedy said Irish reporters were already under enough pressure from drug gangs engaged in violent turf wars in Dublin and Limerick it's bad enough worrying about being the next Veronica Guerin um, uh, the murder crime reporter here in Ireland uh, without uh, the concern of being hauled in by police for simply doing one's job. Well said. Yeah. Um, 
I think we've, we're coming to the end of this this slightly shorter podcast um, for the next podcast, aren't we? Um, we're, we're we're not far off at all. On just uh, give me a second just to do a quick time check. So we've got. Right. Well, I was go- I was going to just quickly bring people to the uh, this little uh, sort of uh, discussion or well this this report really. Yeah. And it's yeah. Bologna International. Uh, Charles Williams Diggs, who we inter- interviewed about the BP Gulf oil spill. Uh, he's put up a story. He works in Russia quite a lot, um, and he's uh, saying that Russian NGOs are struggling. And NGOs are groups of people that are uh, being active about various things. Uh, with the Justice Ministry in Russia warning to call themselves foreign agents in print, so they have to have to actually say, you know, I'm an anti-nuclear activist and a foreign agent. Um, uh, it, but anyway, just as a side issue, Bologna also reported in another article that uh, the activists, the anti-nuclear activists, have told the Russian government to go stuff themselves. So um, that, that's kind of a positive sign, and I hope that uh, that the Russian government doesn't uh, uh, do anything unduly. And we will be reporting about it if they do. Yeah. Well, look. At the end of the day, does it really matter? Because we've got Kevin Hester coming up next, and. Uh, I think the the bottom line is we're all doomed. <laughs> we're doomed, exactly. We're doomed. But, but I, I'm a bit of a positive on this, so I think we're doomed if we don't do something. But anyway, here we go. This is, uh, uh, well, have you got the outro uh, music sorted and the intro stuff? <laughs> I haven't got anything okay. sorted. Yeah. Sure. Look, Let's... you know, you know, I do, you know, I wasn't expecting such a busy Sunday. And uh... Yeah, no, it's crazy. So do you, want, do, do you want an outro there? I think we should just have a pause and then just bring in uh, bring in old Kevin and uh, and then obviously I think we'll have a little pause again and we'll just uh, introduce uh, an amazing interview uh, with John Doe from Tokyo about all things Japanese. <laughs> Cresce só dinheiro, você diz que